I don't know whether it'll take me eight weeks to go through them because after this, I want to talk about what I should. Not what I will, but what I should commit myself to, what I should do. And so I don't know how long this is going to go, but today I want to camp out with the first of the, of the I wills of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 through 30. I have preached through it. You're going to have those of you that write in your Bible about when I preach. You're going to have, probably have several dates there. Um, but it's the first I will that caught my attention of Jesus. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 and following. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good to you in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all, all. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I, here it is, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest twice. You will find rest because I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, there's a lot of messages in here. I just want to camp, camp out on this declaration that Jesus promises to give you and I rest. This rest is, is unique. This rest is not a reprieve. It's not just a, a stop of troubles and, and a, a reprieve in life. It's not a short-term rest. It's not, a re, it's not a rest that comes from medication. I wrote a bunch of people on my hand, so this would be a good time to mention those. Um, if I can read it, the sweat has kind of messed it up. Uh, Rusty had surgery this week. Ellie had surgery this week. Mary Jo had surgery this week. And each time that I contacted them, each of them shared with me, or in Ellie's case, her mother shared and her father shared, that the effects of medication was working on them. This kind of rest is not a medicated rest. It's not a medicated rest. It's not a reprieve. It's not a rest due to fatigue. Uh, I, I can't, I'm trying to, chronic fatigue syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? We had a missionary, oh my goodness, uh, retired military, um, became an international missionary, served for over a decade, a great guy, he served right in the same district as I did. He ran nonstop all of his life. He had picked up a team at the airport, drove them, some of you will know how far this is, drove them all the way down to the south, to the camp down there, dropped them off, got them situated, drove home, told his wife he was going to take a nap. Two weeks later, he was still sleeping. It took years for him to recover. The International Mission Board uh, sent him home on medical and chronic fatigue syndrome. Trish will testify. I don't remember what anniversary it was. We were, we were going to, we did the Alaskan cruise. I had, for several years, I had been running like like something was after me. We got on the boat. We went to our room. She went to the restroom, and I sat down on the couch. I'm not talking about a couple hours. Hours drew into days. It, Trish was so concerned that the guy, the cabin guy that would come to the cabin kept coming to check on me. Trish had said that she had tried many, many, many times to wake me up. It was like I was in a coma. It was chronic fatigue syndrome.
The rest that God gives us is not because we've been running too much. Where our body just quits. It's not a nap. It's not a power nap. It's not a break. This rest is positional and not situational. All of the other ones I've named are rests that are due to the situation that we go through in life. This rest is positional. This rest is only found in one place and one person. It's found in Jesus. This rest is not temporary. And one of our Bible studies, uh, been months now, we talked about peace. It had come up in our study of Revelation and that God gives us peace. And, and I, I share, most of us don't understand or know what that peace yet, but every Christian has that peace. This rest is like that kind of peace. It is not conditioned upon your environment or situation. It is not conditioned upon what's happening in the world. This kind of rest does not change because it is rooted and connected to your relationship with Jesus. It is found in Jesus. It is a gift that he doesn't take aback. It doesn't go away. It is a rest that is also connected to, deeply connected to, the peace he gave. Because this is a rest that in the midst of storms, in the midst of the worst days, you still find that peace, that calm, that rest. It's a rest that communicates that you're secured. That you're in his hands. It's a peace that communicates that you're safe. Even in the midst of troubles, you find this rest this is the rest that comes from Jesus and only from Jesus. So there's four things. Four things that I want to talk about that, that this rest means. In other words, first, we can rest in our salvation. And I really think that is the very heart or the message that Jesus is dealing with. We can rest in our salvation. We can rest in our salvation. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler, he comes looking for Jesus. He's been a Jew. He's been a really, really good Jew, a very religious Jew. He comes to Jesus and he asks the question, how can I have eternal life? The mere fact that he's asking that question, he knows that he doesn't have it. And yet, if you remember, Jesus asked him what the law says, and he says, I've done it all. And Jesus doesn't challenge him. He really has done it all. He's been a very, very good religious Jew. And yet he knows that his soul does not have rest. He does not have that eternal life. And Jesus says a, a simple statement to him. Implying that the guy still wants what he's asking for. Not everybody that asks, how can I have eternal life, really wants to have eternal life. This guy is asking, and he really wants it. And Jesus tells him, he says, well, this is what you got to do. you got to sell everything, and you got to just give it away. And then you can follow me. And you and I hear this, and we want to make it messages about holding on to riches, but it was a simple message. God has done everything. He's done everything. He's done everything to try to be good. Giving his money and being coming poor is not another work for him to do. The bottom line is Jesus saying, if you want to find this internal life and you want to find rest in your salvation then you just need to follow me because rest is in Jesus. This struggle I encounter constantly in counseling with many of you. This is a struggle that you and I should not have. You see, when, when, you, when you seek the Lord and you make a commitment to him and you give him your life and you put your faith in him, then you should find rest. You shouldn't be questioning your salvation. You shouldn't be questioning that. Why? 
Why shouldn't you question? Because your salvation is not through you. Ephesians 2 makes it very clear. It's not about works that I do. It's about what he has done. When I come to Jesus, I find rest in my salvation. I don't have to deal with that anymore. I don't even ask those questions anymore. I know that I am saved because of what he did. It is positional, not situational. My salvation is not based on the hell and the sin and the other ugly things that I might do. My salvation is based on the glorious work of Christ. And there is rest in that. For those of you that do not know that rest, you can't find it even in the very basic. You can't find rest in, your, in his salvation. You think you still have to add to it or perfect it or make it more complete or full, like there's something else you have to do. All he wants you to do is just follow him. It is true, there will be things that he will ask you to do, but not in order for you to be saved. He will ask you to do some things because you are his. And I know that can be very hard and confusing, especially when we live in a world the whole world cries that you have to do this, you have to do that. And some of you may only be here because you're trying to get good enough. You're trying to get to a place to be pleasing. Understand that he loved you while you were a sinner. He doesn't love you anymore because you come to church. There's nothing more he can do. I do what I do, and I come here and I worship and I teach and preach because of what he did, not because of what I'm trying to do. I find an incredible sense of peace, safety, security in the work of what he did in order to save me. I find rest in my salvation. And that can be yours. It's an act of faith where you put all of your heart and all your attention on, what he, on who he is and what he has done instead of the constant struggle in trying to gain it. I printed this out because it's probably best said in, in his own words. Martin Luther uh, his struggle is incredible. He, he, was, he was a young 20-year-old just going, trying to get home on a, in, a, in a horse, care, horse, horse and buggy, and lightning was everywhere around him. And it was hitting trees all along his journey, and he was afraid. And he cried out to God. He said, God, if you'll get me home, I'll become a monk. Well, he got home, became a monk. He never really felt rest in his salvation until one day. But in his desire to find rest, he took vows, entered a monastery. He fasted constantly. He prayed. He mortified his flesh with all the power he could muster. He even took a pilgrimage to Rome and there to demonstrate his total de dedication to the church and to Christ, he climbed on his knees the medieval staircase known as Pilate's Stairs, which were said to have been the stone steps leading up to Pilate's house at Jerusalem. But he did not find peace. He did not find rest. And then one day, a priest told him to study Romans and he didn't get very far. And he read these words in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. You hear that? The righteousness of God is revealed. Oh, what is that? What would it be? The, the cross? Would it be his forgiveness? 
What is the righteousness of God? If God was going to reveal his righteousness, what do you think it would be next? Well, listen to what it says. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As his word says, the just shall live by faith. And finally, Martin Luther got it. It wasn't about what he could do to find peace. It was about accepting the invitation of Jesus and receiving what Jesus had done in order for him to find peace. And Martin Luther, a monk, finally found Jesus and found salvation by a simple act of putting his faith in the work of Jesus, not in his own. That is the very basic of the gospel. Do not miss that. We are given rest. Jesus invited us into his rest through the work that he has done, not the work that you can are called to complete. The second one. We can rest in our sanctification. We can rest in our sanctification. Second Timothy, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 was one of the first verses that Trish and I were challenged to memorize. Now, the fact that I'm looking at it, gives, um, looking for it, gives evidence that when you get old, the things you remember when you were young are no longer still there. And so, first, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, very simple. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that, keep what I have committed to him until that day. That's sanctification. I can rest in the, in the work that Jesus is still doing in me, not just the save work. There, if those of you who have ever studied the scripture much, you will hear that God will talk about salvation as being a past thing. He has saved us. And then in the very next words, he will say he is saving us. And then it talks about he will save us. And that is what happening. That's the glorious work of what God is doing with me. He, he has saved me. He's still saving me from my sins and from myself. I still have to put my faith in. And tomorrow I will put my faith in him again and he will continue to save me. I rest in that. But I also rest in the fact, sanctification means to make holy. I rest in the fact that God is not, not done with me. I am not holy. I just have to look in the mirror. Better yet, all I have to do is ask Trish. I don't do that often because I... I I don't really want to hear what she's going to say about, about me in those areas. But I know I'm not holy. I know that. You see, that's the problem with the others. Those of you that are struggling in your salvation think you have to become holy first. It doesn't work that way. You put your faith in him. He forgives you of your sin. He saves you. Then he begins the work of sanctification, of making you holy. He begins the work of making you pleasing to him. All he asks you to do is what he asks you to do in salvation. Stay close. Just keep following. The beauty of it is, when do we become unholy? When we stop following. Well, what does he do? He comes, he comes to us. He pulls us out. We can, I can, we, we can rest in our sanctification. That word is not, that word sanctification is not used much in Baptist churches. It is a major part of our doctrine. It's just not something we talk about. We're so caught up on, on the first S, the salvation, that we rarely talk about sanctification. But the, the first work and the second work are works of Christ. I find rest, even when I'm not holy. Because I am persuaded, this is a faith statement, I am persuaded that he is more than able and that he will finish what he has started in me. I can rest in that. 
So the next time I prove to you that I'm unholy, just remember God's not done with me yet. Third thing, we can rest in our storms. We can rest in our storms. There's so many scriptures, and I wrote you saw all of my tabs on my Bible today. I'm not going to read them all. I, I wanted to call your attention to Romans chapter 8. You'll know this passage, verse 34 and following. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. That's where he is. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall storms? Or distress? Or persecution or famine? Or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. There is not a storm there is not a storm that can separate you from the love of Christ. No matter how bad, no matter how violent it is. You remember Jonah? Jonah was running from the Lord. He went into, he got a ship. He went down into the bottom of the ship. And he goes to sleep. He is so asleep that in the midst of the storm, the sailors have to wake him up and he doesn't even know what's going on. I, I don't understand that. I've never been able to sleep well when I'm running from God. I've never been able to sleep well when I refuse to repent of my sin. But Jonah didn't have a problem. There's another example of someone asleep in a ship. Do you remember? There's also a storm. And this time... It is Jesus that's asleep in the storm. The disciples are, are the sailors, and they're wide awake, and they are terrified. And Jesus is, is stirred. They wake him up, and he cries. Peace. Be still. And once again, on the sea, his disciples find rest. We can find the same rest. Remember, it's positional, it's eternal, it doesn't go away. That same presence and the same work of God that saves us, the same work of God that sanctifies us, is the same work of God that goes with us in the midst of storms. James chapter 1 is what we studied in Sunday school this morning. And it's a beautiful passage that says, Rejoice whenever any and various trials come to you. No matter how bad they are, no matter what kind. Rejoice because you know something. Do you know something? Do you know what you need to know in order for you to be able to rejoice in the midst of storms? Well, this is what he tells you in James you, you should know. Because you know that he is perfecting you, completing you, making you lacking nothing. He is fulfilling you. That is a faith statement. You're going to have a hard time resting in your storm if you forget that God is still in control. And if you forget that God is trying to do something in you.
Let's come to the last point, and we're going to close up with this. We had supper with Jeff and Bevel Walker last night, and um, I had already been thinking about this, since, but on the way home, I told Trish, I said, take my phone and text Velva and add this one. So she typed it. She sent it. We can rest from our sins. She said, what? So we had a conversation on the way home. I could have put this first one under, this last one under the first one. Because that's usually where I deal with it most. You see, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of people that are believers that struggle with whether the work of Christ is enough for them. Sometimes it's because they're they're not living like they ought. But I want to tell you something. That's not the number of reason. Most of the time that I, when I encounter counseling sessions with an individual, it's because they have no rest from the things that they did before they met Christ. It's a trick, a game that Satan plays with them. Every time they start to follow him and begin to get faithful and doing what he wants them to do, all of a sudden, the Satan comes up and shows them a picture of who they were and all the things that they did. And it just takes them back. They can't, can't get past that. And so... They'll struggle. They'll, they won't, they, they're not in rest. They're, they're in turmoil. They're, they're, they're torn up. Sooner or later, they're going to talk to somebody. It might be a husband. It might be a wife. It might be a friend. But sooner or later, they're going to talk to somebody and say, do you think that God really, really has forgiven me for my past? And sometimes they'll say, if you really knew me, Pastor, you wouldn't love me. Sometimes they'll say, but you don't understand. It wasn't once. You don't understand how deep, how ugly, how dirty I, I defiled myself. You listen. You are the very person that Jesus says, come to me. All you are heavy burden you come to me and I will give you rest the work of his salvation is not only a rest that I have since I am saved I have rest From what I have done. He has forgiven me. And my sins are as far as the east is to the west. He has washed me. When he presents me to the Father. Jesus stands in front. And no matter how ugly. Or what I have done. It's not enough darkness to put out the light of Jesus. That was the thing I liked about the house of refuge most. That it dare put in writing and dare declare to a people who need to hear it. He knows everything about you. And he still loves you. He wants to change you. 
He wants to make you his. You can't make his work better. Listen very careful. You cannot improve on the work of Christ. You cannot make it better. His work was perfect. It still is perfect. And it is more than enough to cover far more than a multitude of sins. It could cover all of the seas and all of the waters on the earth filled with sin. It's that perfect. And so Jesus makes an incredible promise. I will give you rest. Andrew, make your way and whoever else is coming with you. I will give you rest. Do you know that rest? The rest from the struggle and fighting to, to be saved. If not, do, are you ready to find his rest? Do you hear his invitation? Come unto me. All. Oh! And I will give you rest. You find that in him. Put your faith in the work that Jesus has done. Let him save you. And stop trying to save yourself. And you will find rest. Find rest in his sanctification. He is not done with you. Once he saves you, he is not done yet. He is going to present you to the Father on that day you stand before him in all the glory of the very Son himself. He will sanctify you. Some of that he's doing now, but he's going to finish it one day. And you will be what we call the glorification, you'll be, be the glorified body. You should be able to rest in your storms. A Christian should not be crippled by anxiety, worry, and fear every time a storm comes. When a storm comes to a Christian life, their first prayer should not be, get me out of it. Should not be, stop it. It should be, Finish me. Make me perfect, complete. That what, that's what you desire. I want that. Storm, then bring them on. If that's the way perfection comes, then welcome the storm to find rest in Him in the storm. And for those of you, that think that the horrific things that you have done prevent you from ever being pleasing to him. Know that to Jesus you are the pearl of great worth. He left all to come and get you. You're extremely valuable to him. And he will give you rest. You can find rest this morning. Let's stand.